Foundation and the Southeast Medical Advisory Committee, I thank you for joining us this evening. When we hosted last year's debate, we gathered in person before the educational program began for a brief reception, but that's not possible this year. So we welcome you to our virtual pre-debate reception and we encourage you to We encourage you to use the chat feature so we can get to know who is with us and as a way to stay engaged throughout the evening. In the chat box, tell us who you are, where you're from, and please don't be shy about giving shout outs to your favorite team or institution. Before the educational component of the evening begins, we're gonna spend a few minutes in our pre-debate reception. It's important to mention that the second annual Southeast Academic Debates will offer continuing medical education credits and maintenance of certification points. In compliance with ACCME guidelines, there will be no involvement with or mention of any commercial support during the debates. So instead, before the educational program begins, we acknowledge their support of the American Liver Foundation's mission to promote education, advocacy, support services, and research for the prevention, treatment, and cure of liver disease. Let's recognize our national and our Southeast pre-debate reception sponsors. The American Liver Foundation is grateful for support from our national gold sponsor, ASI. Joining us tonight is Leo Cardona, Michael Kriske, Kirsten Ierson, and John Whiteside. Our national bronze sponsors, Salix and CVS Specialty. From Salix, Robin Halbergen and Tracy Pridemore. And CVS Specialty, Sean Kowalski and Cheryl Valdez are with us. Our national partner, Malincrote, is here. John Ball and Denise Bentley, welcome. The American Liver Foundation is grateful for the local support from its Southeast sponsors. Our bronze sponsor, Gilead Sciences, Hello to Paige Johnson and to Sean Rich. Expo sponsors, Intercept Pharmaceuticals, Hello Dar Russell, and Fuji Film Waco Diagnostics, Blake Hicks is with us tonight. We truly appreciate your support of the American Liver Foundation. Now let's turn our attention to two brief videos from our national gold and our national bronze sponsors. Right now, millions of patients are suffering with GI disorders such as overt hepatic encephalopathy, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic idiopathic constipation, opioid-induced constipation, bowel preparation, and ulcerative colitis. At Salix, we have kept up with these unmet needs for more than 30 years by providing an industry-leading portfolio of high-quality products that address these conditions. Through our dedicated and innovative R&D team, we're also exploring potential new scientific breakthroughs. And we remain committed to important healthcare provider investments in education, charitable grants, and sponsorships. We will continue to invest millions of dollars in patient education and do our best to broaden access to Salix medications. Because our mission to improve the care for GI patients continues today. For us, there is no finish line.
Welcome to the American Liver Foundation's second annual Southeast Academic Debates. On behalf of the Southeast Medical Advisory Council, we are excited to bring to you what will be no doubt a remarkable event. The Southeast Academic Debates is a professional education program that will offer continuing medical education credit and maintenance of certification points in partnership with the University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine. All registered participants have received an email with learning objectives and disclosures. Accreditation information will follow. And now, without delay, it is my honor to introduce last year's Southeast Academic Debates Chair and one of this year's amazing co-chairs, a highly respected transplant hepatologist from Tampa General Hospital and a valued member of the American Liver Foundation's Southeast, Academic, uh, Southeast Medical Advisory Council, Dr. Miguel Malispin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. It's been my pleasure to serve as this year's co-chair of the ALF Southeast Academic Debates with my colleague and good friend, Dr. Andre Zori, gastroenterologist and transplant hepatologist from the University of Florida's Shands Hospital in Gainesville. Before he takes over, I'll review the format of this evening and we'll talk a little bit about the ALF. Uh, tonight, we'll be hosting three exciting debates featuring teams from Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. Topics assigned to the debate teams are ethical in nature with no right or wrong answer. Through these debates, we seek to stimulate higher thinking about significant issues that impact the lives of people with liver disease. Debate teams will be judged on presentation content and organization, presentation and rebuttal skills, use of research supporting their position, responses to questions, and overall style and digital delivery. We hope this evening simulates a greater passion and enthusiasm for the field of hepatology ultimately leading to the improved care for liver patients. The debates will be fast paced. Each will start each, will start each debate with a pro presentation followed by an opposing con presentation. Each side is allotted six minutes to present their argument. Should a presenter exceed his or her six minutes, our diligent timekeeper will disconnect their audio and video. We will do our best to transition smoothly from one presenter to the next and keep the program flowing. After both arguments have been presented, each side will have the opportunity to challenge their opposition with a three minute rebuttal. Again, this will be closely timed. A brief question and answer session will follow the rebuttals. We want, to, uh, we want this debate to be interactive. You may use the chat feature to post questions to the debate teams. If time permits, following the judges questions, we'll bring your questions forward. After each debate, three assigned judges will meet privately to discuss the score, to, to, to discuss the score and for the teams. At the conclusion of the three debates, we'll announce the winners of each debate. As a reminder, this evening's educational program will offer CME credits and maintenance of certification points to those who are eligible through the joint sponsorship of the Southeast Academic Debates. This activity has been planned and implemented in accordance to the accreditation requirements and policies of the main medical association through the joint uh, providership of the University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine and the American Liver Foundation. University of New England is accredited by the main medical association to provide continuing medical education for our physicians. All registered attendees will receive information via email regarding more details. Before I turn the program over to Dr. Zori as a proud member of the Southeast Medical Advisory Council, I'd like to say a few words about the ALF. The ALF's mission is to promote education, advocacy, and support services and research for the prevention, treatment, and cure of liver disease. Across the country, the ALF serves patients, caregivers, and healthcare professionals. And this year has been an especially challenging year for all of us. Throughout the evening, we'll share information of how the ALF is furthering their mission and working towards a world without liver disease and how you can support their efforts. And now, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce my co-chair for this year's Southeast, Ad Southeast Academic Debates, Dr. Andre Zori. Thank you, Dr. Malespin, for that introduction. Uh, last year, I served on the judging panel for the Southeast Academic Debates, and it's an honor to be asked to be the co-chair for the 2020 debates. <clears throat> We're very excited to feature six debate teams representing medical institutions throughout the Southeast. So let's recognize them now. Uh, this is also the part of the uh, program where I mispronounce a lot of people's names. Um, from Cleveland Clinic, Florida and Weston, uh, under the mentorship of uh, Qatar Al-Khalufi and Nikhil uh, Kapila, 
The debate team will feature uh, Alberto Gonzalez and Badar Hassan from Emory University in, Orlana, in Atlanta uh, under the mentorship of Dr. Mary Flynn. The debate team will feature uh, Victoria Earl and Raha Sajidi uh, from the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville under the mentorship of Raj Satayana uh, Rayana and Circuit uh, Pung Papong. The debate team will feature Daniela, Daniela Fluxa Cardenia and Himesh Zaver uh, from the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston under the mentorship of Don Rocky and Ira Wilner. The debate team will feature uh, Sebastian Larian and Margaret Morrison from the University of Florida under the mentorship of Raniel Cabrera. The debate team will feature uh, Wee Zhang and Media Ishmael from the University of Florida in Jacksonville under the mentorship of Neha Agarwal and Peter, Peter Ghali. The debate team will feature uh, Carlos Abadir and uh, Bakht uh, uh, Hima. And now I'd like to recognize our esteemed judging panel and thank them for participating in the evening's debates. From Advent Health in Orlando, the mentor of last year's winning team, uh, Dr. Ayman Kutesh. From Cleveland Clinic, Florida, in Weston, Fernando Castro. From Emory University in Atlanta, Ram Subirayan. From Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, <coughs> Andrew Kivney. Mm -hmm. From Tampa General Hospital, Rashid Saeed. Uh, from the University of Florida in Gainesville, uh, Ginger Clark. And from the University of Miami, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Thomas. Uh, please note that to be fair to all the competitors, judges were not assigned to judge the debates that include uh, the team from their respective institutions. Debate number one will be judged by Dr. Clark, Dr. Kivney, and Dr. Syed. Just as a reminder, each team is allotted precisely six minutes to present their argument and three minutes for rebuttal comments, plus a five minute question and answer period at the end. Again, our behind the scenes time, timekeeper We'll mention the clock <clears throat> and disconnect the participants' audio and video if needed. During the debate, the audience is encouraged to use the chat box to cheer for their team, comment, and or share questions for the Q&A session. Uh, we will try to get to your questions after we take questions from the judges. The timekeeper is ready. The debate teams are ready, hopefully. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez and Dr. Hassan from Cleveland Fl Clinic, Florida, will take the pro position. Dr. Earl and Dr. Sajidi will take the Emory, well, from Emory University will take the con position. Their topic is male, a uh, 45 year old male with a history of alcohol related cirrhosis is found to have an acute portal vein thrombus with new onset ascites. Uh, and tips is recommended versus medical management for this issue. So let's begin the first debate. So key issues in our patient, he has decompensated alcohol related cirrhosis, there is portal vein thrombosis. In light of these issues, what is the best treatment modality out there? We all know that hepatic decompensation is associated with portal vein thrombosis. It portal vein thrombosis leads to increased risk of rebleeding and mortality. How does it affect liver transplant? Well, Portal vein thrombosis increases post transplant mortality at 30 day and at one year mark. The reason being grade three and grade four, the extensive and complete portal vein thrombosis contributes to mortality. The reason during transplant is actually the non physiological end to end anastomosis that leads to worse outcome. Now, what we can do about it? Yes, we do have anticoagulation. Which medication to use? Which one to pick? No one knows. Pick your poison. And here are the issues. What about the INR? What about the drug to drug interaction? What about the cost, the inconvenience, the poor compliance? And forget about DOACs. The, the paucity of data is, is, is underwhelming. 
What about the efficacy? Over a dozen studies in the past 20 years or so, they are mostly single center observational with extreme heterogeneity. And ladies and gentlemen, the efficacy is not 100, it's not 90, it's not even 80, it's barely at 40 to 50 percent. Once you stop it, you will get clot. The risk of rhythmosis is up to 38 percent. And you have to take this medication till you get liver transplant. And we want our patients to take this medication daily, two times a day for the rest of the life. Well, think again. It has been shown that 70% of the patients with cirrhosis are identified as having low or medium level of medication adherence. How about traumatic brain injury on anticoagulation? Well, you will get it. 77% of fatal falls are associated with alcohol, including traumatic brain injury. What about bleeding and mortality risk? Well, you will get that as well. The bleeding complication can be as high as 27%, but the devil lies in the detail. If you look at the studies closely, the risk of bleeding and mortality is increased if platelet count is less than 50. There is presence of kidney disease and severity of liver disease. And let's face it, our patients in real life, they have low platelet count, they have kidney disease, and they will bleed. So what we can do about it? Well, we have tips and over thousand cases of literature, uh, portal wind thrombosis has shown to have successful technical feasibility in 80% of the cases. To the point that in 2020, in 2020 uh, TIPS has also shown to uh, be done by ultrasound guidance in the most complicated cases, up to 93%, 95% and with the technical success. Well, how about TIPS in chronic PVT? Our colleagues from Northwestern Group have shown the role of TIPS in patients who were not liver transplant candidate, success up to 98%, uh, TIPS patency 92%. But I want to bring to your attention to the patients who underwent transplant, 23 had end-to-end -end anastomosis, and it was associated with superior outcomes. All right, what about, what about the, the meta-analysis over there? More than 18 studies over the past 20 years, the pool technical success rate, 86.7%. The recanalization rate, up to 84.4%. What about the complete portal recanalization? Well, it is 73.7 and patency at 86.9%. Our patient also has a CITI. How does TIPS help us over there? Well. TIPS decreases liver disease rate at death. It decreases recurrent ascites. It decreases the hepatorenal syndrome. It improves liver transplant free survival to the point that some authors have even recommended TIPS during early ascitic decompensation. And we also know that ascites is an independent risk factor for the viruses. How can TIPS help over there? It decreases the incidence of bleeding related death. But I want to point out the most important part, the subgroup analysis, which showed that TIPS had a survival benefit in patients with severe child class C disease and TIPS with covered sin did not increase the risk of hepatic encephalopathy. And this has been shown by our friends and colleagues from Embry University as well. It increased, TIPS has been successful in 100% of the liver transplant patients who had undergone pre-transplant TIPS. And their hepatic encephalopathy was barely at 7%. But ladies and gentlemen, let's forget about numbers. Let's forget about the recanalization rate and the patency rate. Let's see what does it do for our patients. Well, TIPS improve quality of life. It decreases fatigue. It increases physical performance. It improves the nutritional status. In summary, when we have anticoagulation, which we don't know which anticoagulation to use. What about the renal dysfunction? What about the INR? What about the risk of falls and the traumatic brain injury? What about the bare long-term efficacy at 50%? Worry not, we have tips. INR is not a problem. Falls, not a problem. Successful, 80 to 98%. What about thrombosis? What about the anticoagulation and you cannot perform safe procedure? What about the quality of life? Well, we have tips. Covered patient is sent up to 76%. It controls ascites. It decreases variceful bleeding. It improves the quality of life. It improves the nutritional status. And above all, our friends from Embry University has already shown excellent post-transplant survival rates after pre-transplant tips placement. Thank you very much. Oh, that was great. Um, now it's uh, time for uh, our uh, team from Emory to present their pro position.
or their composition rather. everybody thank you for coming to my debate uh, our debate i'm sorry um what you will take away from this um, talk is that an acute portal vein thrombus um, medical management with anticoagulation is the first line therapy not a tips procedure and when we talk about um, the goals of therapy with portal vein thrombus what we're hoping to achieve is resolution of symptoms, prevention and treatment of mesenteric ischemia, and prevention of thrombus extension. And the way that we measure the success of this treatment is by portal vein recanalization. Now, there has been a meta-analysis by Lofredo and his colleagues in which they compared portal vein recanalization in patients um, treated with anticoagulation versus those who were not treated with anticoagulation. And what you can see in this first row here is that the rate of portal vein recanalization was statistic statistically greater in the anticoagulation treated group compared to the no treatment group. And then when you look specifically at those who um, had a complete recanalization, um, again, the anticoagulation group was um, had a statistically significant um, increase in recanalization compared to the no treatment group. This here is a pictorial view of some of the different um, trials included in that study, where each vertical bar represents an individual study with the dark gray representing um, success, successful recanalization. And what you can see is that in most of these studies, um, you have very high rates of recanalization. So again, anticoagulation is effective for um, treating a portal vein thrombus and causing recanalization of the portal vein. Now, um, whenever we talk about therapy, we always talk about the benefits, which as I've shown you is recanalization, but what about the risks? And what some might say is that in anticoagulated patients, there's an increased risk of, risk of bleeding, especially in patients with cirrhosis, but Cirrhotic patients are actually not at increased risk of bleeding. This is a misconception. In cirrhosis, you do have an alteration of the coagulation cascade where you have altered levels of pro and anticoagulant factors, but this results in a new homeostasis. And within this homeostasis, patients can tip towards bleeding or thrombus formation, but cirrhosis in and of itself is not a state of increased bleeding risk. And our colleague before me mentioned the INR, but INR as a measure of coagulopathy is actually not validated in cirrhosis. So it's not even a useful tool in these patients. Um, and speaking more about the risk of bleeding, uh, the same study by Lafreda et al. showed that anticoagulation is not associated with increased bleeding with acute portal vein thrombosis and cirrhosis. So again, in the first row, you see that there's no difference in the rate of any bleeding in either study group. And actually the rate of spontaneous variceal bleeding is significantly reduced in the anticoagulation treated group compared to the no treatment group. So not only do you have equal rates of bleeding between groups, you actually had, this actually held true in patients on anticoagulation who had prior history of variceal bleeding. And even more importantly, is that you have a significantly decreased rate of spontaneous variceal bleeding in the anticoagulation treated group. So, so far what we know is that anticoagulation therapy um, is, leads to a high percentage of portal vein recanalization and that we actually don't see increased bleeding with treatment with anticoagulation. Um, when we look at mortality as a result of anticoagulation, um, with, this is a meta-analysis that is comparing anticoagulation-treated patients to controls and then separately looks at studies where um, patients who underwent TIPS um, were compared to those, who, uh, to those patients who did not receive therapy. And what they found in this study was that anticoagulation actually led to a decreased mortality, whereas TIPS did not. So 
On top of what I've told you, that anticoagulation leads to portal vein recanalization, that there's not an increased risk of bleeding with it, that um, there's actually a decrease in mortality uh, with anticoagulation that does not exist with TIPS. Um, there actually is an exciting possible benefit of anticoagulation in um, cirrhotic patients. And this is surrounding the theory of parenchymal extinction, where it's believed that um, there are microthrombi within the liver that um, can actually clot off blood vessels, leading to decreased blood flow, causing ischemic tissue injury and expediting liver fibrosis. But there has been um, a trial that shows that anticoagulation in patients with new onset ascites may decrease formation of intrahepatic microthrombi, thereby slowing liver fibrosis. And as I mentioned, there was this one study um, that did find this in their patients. So not only does anticoagulation um, recanalize the portal vein, decrease overall bleeding, it actually may even have a benefit of slowing down liver fibrosis. So what are the take home points? Our goal for therapy in portal vein thrombus is to resolve symptoms, prevent long-term sequela of portal hypertension. We know that um, in patients treated with anticoagulation, they have an increase. All right. Um, so that was our timekeepers. Um, letting us know that the time has expired. Um, and uh, so we're gonna move on to the uh, rebuttals. Um, first, uh, we will have the, the pro team from Cleveland Clinic. Hello, uh, thanks for the presentation and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, you know, first let me start off by saying the two meta-analyses that were presented here are heavily flawed. The first one was Lofreda et al. that came out in 2017. There's actually been a couple meta-analyses since then, but we can uh, look at this study. The first thing is that the data on anticoagulation for portal vein thrombosis relies almost solely and very heavily on single center, small, uh, retrospective, non-randomized observational studies. And the problem with that becomes that you cannot tell why the patient was placed on anticoagulation or not. And that is very, very important. Um, you know, so let's start with Lofreda. Lofreda was a meta-analysis. You know, there was actually an editorial about this. The problem with this study, the main problem, is that one of their main studies was by Dr. Chung, uh, or sorry, Dr. Wang in 2016. And that study actually was a randomized controlled trial, which had 50 patients. All of them had tips with fantastic recanalization rates. And uh, that study, uh, then after that, they randomized the two uh, groups into anticoagulation versus no anticoagulation. And actually what that uh, study showed was that um, you don't need anticoagulation after TIPS. So, you know, that study should not have been included in that meta-analysis and that meta-analysis loses credibility because of that and because of all the, the observational studies. In the, in the other study, the other meta-analysis, Davis, they looked at mortality, but they included two uh, new retrospective studies. One of them was by Pettinari, which is a, a doctor from Italy, and this came out in the Red Journal. And the main problem with that study is, again, the retrospective nature, and they put this in the discussion. Why were some patients on anticoagulation and why were some not? If you look at the study group, the patients that were not on anticoagulation, the control group, they had higher rates of child B uh, and child QC cirrhosis. They had higher rates of ascites. They had higher rates of, of uh, esophageal variceal bleeding, and they had uh, higher melds. So to compare survival using that study is, is heavily, heavily flawed. Obviously, patients with child QC cirrhosis are, will do much worse, you know, no matter what you do, than child QA. I mean, that, that's just the fact of the matter. You talked about you know, the coagulation cascade with cirrhosis, but that is not the mechanism of why, you know, the main mechanism that causes portal vein thrombosis in cirrhotic patients is the fact that you have a low flow state. Anticoagulation will not help that. The only thing that will help that is restoring that portal flow. You'll have, you'll put the tips in, you'll restore the portal flow. And because of that, you will have a decrease immediately of portal vein thrombosis, 
you have improvement in recurrent ascites, uh, recurrent esophageal variceal bleeding, and improvement in survival. All right, guys, I think we're heating up a little bit. So now it's time for uh, the con um, rebuttal from Emery. We'll All right, thanks ahead. everyone for listening tonight. So our position is while tips might be feasible to treat portal vein thrombus in cirrhotic patients, it should in no way be the first approach to portal vein thrombosis treatment, even in the setting of ascites. As physicians, we vow to do no harm. And by that, we, that means that we're committing to performing the least invasive and lowest risk interventions first. And this is especially true when the rates of success between the two are comparable, like between anticoagulation and TIPS. While the technical success rate of TIPS placement is high, complications can occur and drastically alter the patient's quality of life and prognosis. This includes not only hepatic encephalopathy, which the other team mentioned, but also hemorrhage, biliary injury, injury to surrounding structures, and also cardiac decompensation. Additionally, the technical difficulty of TIPS limits its widespread application. Yes, we have great success with TIPS here at Emory, but that's absolutely not true at all institutions and the technical success is highly variable. And like I mentioned before, TIPS, is effect TIPS can be effective, but it's comparable to anticoagulation. Um, furthermore, the body of evidence for TIPS is also just as weak as it is for anticoagulation. All the subjects in these studies are heterogeneous, most are not getting TIPS primarily due to their PVT, so we don't even know who's being excluded from these studies. And most of the patients in these studies have very low MELT scores. And bleeding appears to me the most feared risk in this population on anticoagulation, but there's a lot of evidence that actually supports that anticoagulation therapy is safe with a low rate of complication. As Raha mentioned, cirrhosis is not a state of hypocoagulability. Um, and yes, the INR is not validated in this population because that only um, measures anticoagulant factors when we all know that cirrhotics also have um, issues with their pro-coagulant uh, factors. Based on a systemic review and meta-analysis, patients with cirrhosis and PVT who receive anticoagulant therapy have no excess of major and minor bleeding and less incidence of variceal bleeding compared to patients who did not receive anticoagulation. And in fact, there's actually some evidence that the DOACs are safe in this population. There's a systemic review that demonstrates that newer oral, anticoagulation, oral anticoagulants are safe and efficacious alternatives to traditional anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin and vitamin K antagonists in the treatment of acute portal vein thrombosis with or without cirrhosis. And there's really little, limited evidence of harm associated with anticoagulation. In fact, there actually might be benefit to anticoagulation. In a 2019 meta-analysis from UVA revealed that both treatments improve the rate of recanalization and that anticoagulation actually has a mortality benefit not seen with TIPS. There's also evidence from a prospective trial treating patients um, empirically with, pro, uh, with uh, low molecular weight heparin that shows that the prevention of portal vein thrombosis is associated with decreased hepatic decompensation and improved survival. And there's also animal studies that show reduced fibrogenesis in murine models All right, guys, the timekeepers are uh, keeping everyone in line, but that was very exciting. Um, thank you guys to the um, teams. You guys both did a really great job presenting a lot of enthusiasm, so congratulations. Um, thanks also to everyone um, who's sharing the comments in the chat uh, box and uh, sending their shout outs. Um, if we get time to answer your questions, we'll also get to those. Um, first, um, I'd like to turn to Dr. Um, Keedney to see one of our judges to see if he has any questions for um, either of the teams. Thank you. Great debate. Uh, for the, the, the pro side, uh, tell me about the, uh, tell me how much data that there are placing tips in patients with uh, high MEL scores and CTP scores greater than 13. Hi, um, you know, the, well, you know, the, the two most recent randomized controlled trials by Dr. Liu and Dr. Uh, Laveau uh, that came out around 2018 or so, they had, I believe about a third of patients were child pew uh, B and C, uh, at least C um, for Dr. Liu. Um, and, uh, you know, that's one thing, but, uh, you know, our patient isn't necessarily child pew C. 
Uh, it's been a okay. I have no more questions. All right, and um, Dr. Syed, do you have any questions for the either of the teams? I know questions for me. All right, and Dr. Clark, any questions? Uh, <clears throat> my question uh, is for the anticoagulation uh, for Emory. Um, I didn't hear, uh, can you comment on any benefits for uh, transplantation in a, in a patient that's anticoagulated? not just mortality. Yeah, so um, there is, a, we do see improved transplant outcomes um, in patients who uh, have resolution of portal vein um, thrombus. Um, so that is again, another reason to treat with anticoagulation, um, at least first to see, um, have a, a, can you resolve that clot? And the idea being that um, when, if there's a portal vein thrombus in place, it makes the transplant surgery technically more difficult. And also given the technical limit limitabilities of TIFs, oftentimes patients are, um, it can decrease their eligibility for liver transplant if there's you know, a problem with the TIFs procedure. Thank you. All right, and we um, have a question from um, the viewers for this is from Deep Energy, one of our UF uh, internal medicine residents, uh, soon to be GI fellow. He asks uh, for the Emory team, which anticoagulant is preferred in this indication if there is one? Um, definitely low molecular weight heparin is the most studied. Of course, it's limited um, with renal insufficiency, but it is the most widely studied. Um, and, you know, because of its limitation with the renal insufficiency, that's why there's more investigation into the DOAX and the initial, you know, studies looking at that actually show that they can be safe. All right, great. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, uh, the judges from this debate will now move into a private uh, virtual meeting room uh, to discuss uh, and try to come up with a winner. Uh, before we move to debate number two, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Barb Bobby Zervos, co-chair of the American Liver Foundation Southeast Medical Advisory Council, who uh, will share a few words. Good evening and thank you, Dr. Zori. As you may know, I have been a member of the American Liver Foundation Southeast Board of Directors, and I serve in a leadership role on the Southeast Medical Advisory Council. I became involved with the ALF in 2016 and have supported its efforts to establish the Southeast Board of Directors and Medical Advisory Council. Since then, with support from the medical community in Florida and Georgia and the other states in the southeastern United States, we have provided local educational programs for healthcare providers, patients, caregivers, and the general public. And we have engaged the liver community in special events like the Liver Life Walk, the Flavors of Miami, and the Flavors of Atlanta events. The world changed drastically in 2020, but the mission of the American Liver Foundation remained the same. As a result of the pandemic and a significant loss of revenue, the ALF was forced to change how it delivered its mission across the country. It underwent a restructure and pivoted to a virtual environment in order to continue to serve liver patients, their families, and healthcare providers. As we all know, many liver patients are uniquely vulnerable to COVID-19 and rely upon the ALF for essential information, support, and guidance. In 2020, calls to ALF's helpline increased significantly. There were nearly 152,000 visits to the ALF website by those seeking information on COVID-19. The ALF staff continues to offer educational programs, support services, and advocacy initiatives online instead of in person. Since 1976, the ALF has been the nation's leading nonprofit dedicated to liver health. It provides a voice for millions of Americans living with liver disease. Dollars donated tonight will be directed back into patient and professional educational programs, similar to the debates this evening, as well as support services, advocacy, and research. Now more than ever, the ALF relies on the, our support in order to thrive. 
So tonight, I ask you to consider making a donation to support the mission of the America Labor Foundation. Simply go to alfevents.org forward slash academic debates Florida and click on the red donate button. The link will be provided in the chat box on the right. Your donation is tax deductible and will impact the lives of people with liver disease and help the ALF raise awareness to promote liver health. And now Dr. Zori will take over and introduce our next debate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zervos. Uh, let's move on to debate number two. The judges for this debate will be Dr. Castro, Dr. Thomas, and Dr. Subramayan. Let's, uh, just a reminder that the, to the debate teams, please keep your, to your allotted times for your presentation and rebuttals so our timekeeper doesn't have to disconnect uh, your audio and video and you uh, lose out on the opportunity to present some of your points. The timekeeper is ready. The debate teams are ready. Um, from UF, we're gonna have Dr. Zhang and Dr. Ishmael, uh, UF from Gainesville. Uh, we'll make the pro position, Dr. Larian and Dr. Morrison from the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, we'll take on the con position. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that this is um, uh, a little bit of an atypical topic um, and I appreciate uh, their efforts in, in uh, taking this on. The, new, the question is, the new liver allocation system has decreased health disparities uh, in the United States. Please begin. Good evening. Mm -hmm. The new liver allocation system has decreased health healthcare disparities. We are the pro team with the University of Florida. Prior to this year, the prior system show, uh, was based arbitrarily on regions uh, designed by across the US map as shown in our background here, where it showed where you could get transplanted uh, based on your region. This created a lot of challenges. Uh, these basically were uh, you could see variations in death rates, transplant rates, rates and uh, melts at transplantation between different regions. Um, we could also see uh, increases in patients who listed at different regions with, and thus increasing socioeconomic disparities. Um, what became known as the melt elevator also led to increases in exception transplantation rates. Um, in regards to the uh, wait list, about 31% of patients that did also see um, either died or were too sick to be transplanted within three years of um, listing. And then last but not least, um, we saw pediatric population having higher mortality and longer wait lists uh, on that system. Thus, the idea was to guided by the a final rule uh, with uh, to create this new policy. And it was used to basically improve utility of uh, organs uh, distribution justice and how you're distributing these organs um, with allocating them to most medical urgent based on urgency and then distributing it among different um, patients. With that, two major changes were made. First was the new allocation circles. Um, this was based around um, 150 nautical miles, 250 and 500 nautical miles around the donor liver hospital. And then the second was the National Liver Board Review, which basically equalized meld for exception status patients uh, within the region. How do we look at outcomes? So this is fairly new and what we used is uh, the data from the liver simulation allocation model, as well as the six month data out of this new policy to compare the two uh, results. Looking at the model, um, we predicted in the post um, re era to decrease uh, meld variance. And we could see based on these maps um, that meld variance decreased um, from about 10 to about four in the post uh, policy era. This comes in realization in our six, mo in six month data where we could actually see uh, that variance has decreased across the board um, from about 19 in the year 2019 to about um, 15 within the past six months. What else? So we can also see improved transplantation rates. Um, in this figure, we're looking at transplantations per 100 active patient years and across the MELD scores. We can see over here that 
orange is the post era and blue is the pre era. And with higher melds, you can all see across from melt 23 and above and status one, you can see higher transplantation rates. This, of course, translates to decreasing weightless removal and decreased weightless mortality across most regions. This results was also seen despite um, the claim that this will lead to less, um, to more uh, disparities among uh, ethnicities. We could see in our new data that looking at the blue uh, numbers over here, that across different ethnicities, you see increased transplant offers regardless of your ethnicity group. What else? Looking back at the National Liver Board data, um, we can see that the non-exception transplant denoted by blue, which is the majority of our patients and the sicker patients, get more transplants uh, based on the national, based on standardizing the national review, and we'll see non-HCC non exception patients getting less. This was shown without increasing mortality of the wait list on the non-exception HCC patients. Looking at the pediatrics, for pediatric patients, uh, we see more pediatric donor livers being allocated to um, younger uh, recipients. Specifically looking at the 11, uh, 12 to 17 age, we can see um, getting more transplants. Based on the data for three years and, and the liver simulation model, this results in about 77% of pediatric donors going to young children, as opposed to what, is current, what was currently at that time, 45% with the old system. So in conclusion, we can see that the new system does improve geographic variance in median meld or pelvic transplant. It does improve transplant rate and decrease weightless mortality rate and results will increase percentage of non-exception transplant recipients without changing in liver transplant weightless rates. And last but not least, um, does improve pediatric access to young donor transplantations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ismail, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Um, we'll move uh, right along over to the con position from MUSC. Uh, good evening. Um, we are going to argue that the new allocation system, in fact, worsens healthcare disparities and, in fact, creates a flight of organs from the poor rural South. So, um, as previously, uh, uh, my opponent discussed, that the previous allocation system was based on these 11 geographic regions. The MELD score created this priority for the sickest patients. It was, in fact, that um, those in the Southeast region were typically transplanted at a lower MELD. Now, with the um, introduction of the acuity circle policy, which has really only been in effect for about six to seven months, um, creates these geographic concentric circles. A donor, a donor liver can travel up to 500 nautical miles. Um, and of course, this was all enacted in the middle of a global pandemic. We are still using MELD as the priority here. I think it's important to understand this argument by looking at two different patients and looking at their experiences. Patient A is a 55 year old female with decompensated NASH. She lives in Anderson, South Carolina, a very rural community that we're familiar with here. Uh, she lives in poverty with a meld of 30. That's in contrast to patient B, who's a 55 year old female, again, with the same chronic liver disease. She lives in the Bronx in New York. Her income is again the same with a similar meld. We are going to argue that the new system creates even more um, creates even more trouble for patient A. We will argue that a meld of 30 in rural South Carolina does not equal a meld of 30 in urban New York. And why is that? So let's look at mortality rates first. I think that's really important. So the mortality rates pre-change in allocations, this is 2018 data, South Carolina had a higher mortality for chronic liver disease in comparison to our patient in New York. This is again, prior to the new allocation policies. I believe this is uh, mostly related to rural healthcare disparities, and we're going to focus on that today. Uh, we understand that the foundation of, of rural healthcare disparities is understanding that there's such a lack of access to providers. We know that there's fewer primary care doctors, and even more so, there are fewer specialists, such as a transplant hepatologist. For example, um, per 100,000 people in a population in a rural community, there are 30 specialists. In comparison, per 100,000, there's almost 300 
um, in an urban community. So a 10 times greater um, number of specialists, which creates more access to care. We also know that those in rural health, uh, rural communities have a higher prevalence of, of comorbid conditions that might not actually be reflected in a MELD, but will contribute to the overall uh, sickness of our patients. The, uh, we know that in rural communities, there's more diabetes, there's also more coronary disease. Again, this is all not reflective in that MELD. Let's look at just physical distance and physical access. Our patient A has a 226 mile journey to see us, the only transplant center in the state. That is in stark contrast to uh, the, our patient B, who is one and a half miles away from the nearest transplant, transplant center in New York. That's a 16 minute bus ride, which runs every seven minutes. There are going to be significant physical barriers for our patient already. Now with the new allocation system, we know it has now created more um, equalization of the MELD. And we can see from this map that the MELD, the average transplantable MELD is going to increase, particularly in the poor rural South. We can look at these numbers um, and start to see what OPTN uh, has started to publish to see, you know, we're very limited by the amount of data, but we can start to see who is benefiting from this. So if we look in South Carolina, we did about 80 transplants last year. We are not going to hit that number as we close the end of the year, um, hitting around 49. That is in contrast to New York, patient B, who's actually on par to potentially have a better year than last year. So I want to refocus on this because I think that this is, is kind of the, the most important thing, that the mortality in a lot of these poor rural southern states was already higher. Um, by, and so by creating this policy that moves organs out of these regions, we're only going to increase that number. I want to touch very briefly on the fact that these policy changes, um, and we are having, you know, caused quite of a debate before, did not address that there are significant vari variants in the OPO performance. And so it's very, we understand that there are 13,000 ish patients waiting on the transplant list. We only do about 8,000 a year. We need to increase the supply to match the demand. So will patient A and patient B have the same outcome? And the answer is no. So despite a similar meld, patient A is at a higher risk for a poor outcome. She's at higher risk to have less physical access to us. She's more likely to come to us later in her um, disease state. She's more likely to come to us with more comorbid conditions. Um, and therefore her meld of 30 is not equivalent to our patient B who also has a meld of 30. Going forward, I really think one, we need to address OPO performance status or, or uh, status and addressing poor performing OPOs. On top of that, we need to create an allocation system that not only understands but accounts for the healthcare disparities that we know exist in our rural communities today. Thank you very much. Again, really uh, great pr uh, presentation. Um, Thank you, uh, Dr. Morrison. That was fantastic. Uh, now we're going to move on to the uh, pro rebuttal uh, from Dr. Zhang uh, from the University of Florida. Okay. Right. Thanks. I thank my colleague uh, on the other side for the for this interesting presentation. However, I do not agree with some of the points she mentioned. First, I think my colleague mentioned about uh, two very interesting patients. Uh, one in South Carolina, the other one in New York City. And she mentioned that, you know, because uh, of, of, of access to healthcare, um, they, uh, even with the same uh, male score, they may not uh, have the same mortality rate. However, you know, nationally, male score uh, is the best score so far uh, that can predict mortality. And, you know, the increased mortality in those patients with even lower male score with, um, uh, who are in this rural area, they actually um, uh, does have nothing to do with our current uh, allocation system. So according to a uh, uh, the, the uh, OBTN uh, report, um, the, uh, they did not find actually any increased disadvantage, uh, disadvantages of the most vulnerable people. In fact, actually the previously disadvantaged population with higher male score was a prioritized and resulted in the increased transplant rate and overall decreased mortality rate as reported in a six month report. 
Also, as we have shown, that there was more equitable ethical access to the number of offers per active patient year waiting. Therefore, um, this have shown improved healthcare disparity regarding the lever uh, allocation. And um, according to the uh, 2018 UNOS annual report, factors uh, other than the liver allocation, such as overall access to healthcare, access to high quality specialty care for liver, liver disease and pre-transplant management may contribute to wait list mortality and healthcare disparity. A second, my colleague, men my colleague mentioned about, you know, this uh, decreased overall uh, transplant uh, numbers in uh, South Carolina. But however, they did not mention that those states had very low male score, like medium male score before this uh, allocation. We actually, especially South Carolina has the lowest male score uh, at 22, while uh, New York has 34 uh, before this new policy, which is, uh, this, this created the biggest inequity and most, most it, it, they are most criticized uh, in this previous system. Um, and this new uh, uh, allocation system, uh, the trend is actually proving that this new system is working well it was, uh, at prioritizing patients with high male score. Therefore, the policy has improved inequity by decreasing the variable male score between different regions. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Zhang. Uh, we're going to move on uh, to the con position from the Medical University of South Carolina and Dr. Larian. Thank you. So healthcare disparities can be defined as differences in healthcare utilization based on cultural, socioeconomic, and geographic differences between population groups, and this may impact patient outcomes. And while the UF group presented data relating to equitable ethical access to transplants, it failed to mention that not everyone starts at the same playing field with respect to social determinants of health. The number is not the point. In addition to race, health disparities include factors such as age, sex, income, insurance, and distance from transplant center, all of which have replete data in the literature showing that it can adversely impact uh, social uh, determinants of health. And what about data regarding the impact of these factors in addition to the male score on patient mortality with the new allocation system? Moreover, these factors unfairly disadvantage the rural southern states, states who already have the higher organ donation rates in the northeast and utilize male exception, exception points far lower than their northeastern counterparts, for example, only 28% in a recent study from 2018. 28% of cases had mild exception points compared to 46% of their transplant cases having mild exception points in the Northeast. And thus, while they present data arguing that the proportion of no exception cases have increased, they failed to mention that the significant variability with granting mild exception points not only within the regions, but within centers within the same states. And decreased transplant volume may also force smaller transplant centers, those that serve the rural and underserved population, who may be more adversely affected by a small number of poor outcomes. This would ultimately result in compromised waitlist access, higher rates of death from liver disease, and higher waitlist mortality. Thus, against the stipulation of the final rule mandates, which is a just and fair distribution of liver organs, these result in unfair distribution that may adversely affect the most vulnerable in our population. The new system should instead focus on incentivizing new technologies that improve liver preservation prior to transplant, as well as new policies that increase organ sharing and donation and promote healthy habits. Thus, while well-intentioned, the new liver allocation system has only exacerbated existing inequities in healthcare that ultimately will perpetuate a system that results in a theft of organs from the poor, rural, and disadvantaged South to the more afflu affluent and healthier regions in the Northeast. We strongly encourage an open discussion on the negative impacts of the new liver allocation system on health disparities in the United States. Thank you. All right, thank you guys, uh, both teams. That was really great. Again, uh, thanks for tackling a difficult topic that really has a lot of significance for um, many of our patients. Um, so the, <clears throat> it'll certainly, certainly make it difficult for the judging panels. Remember, we'll ask, announce the winners of each debate at the end of the program. We also encourage you guys to keep uh, sharing comments in the chat box and pose questions or share a compliment. 
tell us which medical institution you or city you represent and the role you play in the fight against liver disease. Now let's turn to our judges in this debate so they can ask some questions. Um, first, uh, I'll ask if uh, Dr. Castro, do you have any questions for either of the teams? Um, sure. Um, good evening. Uh, great, uh, great job. Um, my question is uh, for the UF um, uh, team. And um, basically, I mean, there was a slide there that was very quickly presented in the um, healthcare disparities among, among ethnicities and race. And um, my question is, does it increase the percentages of all races and ethnicities by the same percentages, or was there an improvement for those uh, uh, disadvantages, uh, disadvantage races and ethnicities, say black, Hispanics, uh, minorities? So uh, you're right. Actually, uh, if you look more at the data, you'll see more of the patients with the uh, lower minority ethnicities uh, with higher males actually getting more offers for transplantation. So it does improve that as well. All right. And um, Dr. Thomas, do you have any uh, questions for either of the teams? Yeah, I'd like to ask a question to the con group. Uh, Dr. Zervos did a survey of Southeast transplant centers, clearly demonstrating that COVID is having an impact on uh, the work being done in these centers. Do you think COVID-19 with its impact on rural areas and populations that lack access to healthcare, do you think this is going to actually uh, show more problems in this new system? I mean, I think the new system creates problems in every realm here for particularly, I'm going to say us in the, in South Carolina. So yes, I think we have such a, a limit. Our healthcare system is so limited. 90% of our state is, is rural. So even when we talk about, I mean, COVID of, of course has created a lot of limitations nationally. Um, our patients have a hard time accessing physicians in every aspect. So I think that this just continues to create a, a kind of a snowball effect of, of problems for us. Um, and again, it, it all comes down to a, a really just even physical access to providers in, in all healthcare realms. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Dr. Subramanian, I'm not sure if you have any questions for the debate team. No, I don't have any questions, great debate. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zori. Uh, before we move on to our third and final uh, debate, um, I would like to acknowledge and thank the extraordinary efforts of every healthcare professional joining us this evening, especially those who treat liver disease. Uh, None of us could have imagined what would have unfolded this year in 2020, but it was no surprise to see the dedication, selflessness, and commitment put forth by the healthcare heroes across our country this year. Liver centers across the country were impacted. In many places, treatments and transplants were postponed. Our patients were terrified, and you and I, their trusted medical families and friends, were there for them. Tonight, the ALF recognizes and thanks you for your sacrifices and your efforts in this fight against COVID-19. We salute you. Please stay safe. Even though we cannot host the academic debates in person this year, it has been great to read the comments and see who and who is in this audience. I know the teams appreciate your support and so does the ALF. Meanwhile, we welcome you to continue to share your comments in the chat box. It's time now to start debate number three, um, the final debate. The judges for this debate will be Dr. Clark, Dr. Kotesh, and Dr. Syed. Again, a reminder to the debate teams, please keep in mind that the time limits for your presentations and rebuttals so that your audio and video are not disconnected. The timekeeper is ready. The debate teams uh, are ready. The two teams from uh, uh, Jacksonville will face off. This will be a heated Jacksonville uh, 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 debate. So Dr. Uh, Fluxa Cardenas and Dr. Xavier from Mayo Clinic, Jacksonville will take the pro position and Dr. Abadir and Dr. Chima from the University of Florida Jacksonville will take the con position. Their topic is a 52 year old male with a history of stage four chronic kidney disease, not on hemodialysis. With cirrhosis presents your clinic. He's found on endoscopy to have large esophageal varices and mild hepatic encephalopathy. Treatment for hepatitis C should begin immediately. And please 
begin. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Himesh Zaver, and on behalf of Dr. Flixa and I, uh, we'll be presenting debate number three, the pro argument. Again, this is our topic. So let's better define our patient. Uh, we know we have a 52-year-old male uh, with stage four kidney disease. He is not on dialysis. Uh, he has a known diagnosis of cirrhosis as evidenced by his esophageal varices and mild hepatic encephalopathy. I think it's important to note uh, what we do not know with this patient. We do not know his genotype, uh, his MELD or child puke score, the origin of his CKD, uh, whether his varices have bled or not, um, or if he's had other manifestations of cirrhosis. Um, and we believe that treatment for his hepatitis C should begin immediately. So why should treatment begin now? Well, well, we believe treatment should begin now because of the achievement of a sustained virological response is quite successful and high in patients with advanced or decompensated cirrhosis. Uh, this is important given uh, that this patient has um, portal hypertension as evidenced by his esophageal varices, and we know that successful HCV treatment can improve hepatic function in up to 20 to 60 percent of patients. Uh, and given his encephalopathy and varices and undifferentiated kidney disease, um, this, can, uh, this is important. So regarding his, um, uh, the achievement of the sustained virological response, we know that successful HCV treatment can lower the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. We also know that successful uh, uh, sustained virological response can lower the risk of liver-related death, and that sustained virological response can lower the risk of all-cause mortality uh, compared to those with chronic HCV. Given this patient has unknown renal impairment, we know that chronic HCV is an independent risk factor for CKD and that the progression uh, to end-stage renal disease in patients with CKD is higher in those with, under, with untreated chronic HCV. So what options do we have? Well, we know uh, there were several trials that have evaluated the safety of, of direct-acting antivirals. So the C-Surfer trial evaluated the safety of gruzipravir and elvisivir, and the Expedition 4 and 5 trials evaluated the safety uh, of glipoprevir and prednisovir. For patients, for providers wanting to use sovisvivir based regimens, we know that IDSA and ASLD guidelines do have safety regimens for uh, sovisvivir based regimens for patients with a GFR less than 30. So why should we even delay treatment? Well, we know that this patient, uh, we do not know if this patient is even eligible for transplant. Does he have any relative or absolute contraindications to transplant, uh, such as alcohol or substance abuse? Does he even have the psychosocial support to successfully undergo transplant? Nor do we know if he has, even has access to a transplant center. We know that there are several studies that have shown that pre-liver transplant treatment can reduce the burden on liver transplant waiting lists. And given this patient uh, has CKD, he possibly might need a, a simultaneous liver kidney. And so successful pre-liver transplant treatment can not only reduce the MELD score, but also can subsequently delist patients as evidenced by the study by Dr. Belly et al. And the economics, uh, when you consider uh, the cost of liver transplant and compare that uh, to a direct acting uh, antiviral regimen, we know that access to uh, direct acting antivirals is more accessible and they become cheaper and that pre-liver transplant treatment 
is cost saving and cost of, is cost saving for patients with a MELD score of 15 or less and cost effective in patients with a MELD score between 16 and 21. And when you think about the quality adjusted life years, we know uh, pre-liver transplant treatment compared to post-liver transplant is higher when treated pre-liver transplant. So in conclusion, why should treatment begin now? Well, we believe that there are many reasons. The potential benefits of obtaining sustained biological response has both economic benefits, societal benefits when you think about the reduction in the transplant waiting list, as well as hepatic and extra hepatic benefits. And this particular patient, the alleviation of his portal hypertension can alleviate the burden of his variceal bleed, of his, uh, of his esophageal varices, uh, the reduction in the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, and improvement of his hepatic encephalopathy. And with this undifferentiated kidney disease, if it is related uh, to his hepatitis C diagnosis, this could potentially also improve. In conclusion, we believe that treatment should begin immediately, um, also due to the reasons for a reduction in all-cause mortality, liver-related death. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, we're gonna move on to uh, the composition. Hi everybody, my name is uh, Carlos Abadir. I'm a first year GI fellow at the University of Florida in Jacksonville. To treat or not to treat, uh, this is not the question. Um, I think the argument is all about the appropriate timing and the right setting. Um, I adapted this algorithm from Ekpani Wong's study uh, for patient with HCV and decompensated cirrhosis. If they are not a candidate for transplant, then it's no brainer. We just treat their HCV, as my colleague said before. But if they are a candidate for transplant, then the mode score is going to play a major role in defining how do we proceed. In patients who has mode score less than 15, then we can uh, they may benefit from treatment before transplant. But in patients who has mode score above 20, they uh, recommend treatment uh, after transplant. So what do we actually do for patients that have MELD score is between 15 and 20? That's the major question. And uh, if we took a look at our patient, and uh, yeah, yes, we don't know a lot of information about our patient, but let's assume, make some assumption, let's assume that his creatinine is 2.5 based on the idea that we have a stage four kidney disease. And if we consider, which is not gonna be real in the real world, if we consider that albumin, bilirubin, and INR are completely normal, then his MILT score is gonna be at least 17. And he's gonna fall in this category here between 15 and 20. And here are the six major uh, points that we argue why we should not treat this patient immediately. So in 2017, the study from Spain, Fernandez et al. investigated the DAA uh, in patients with advanced liver disease using the Spanish Hep C registry, his conclusions support our argument. Number one, the SVR was much lower in child view class B and C, 78% versus 94% for child view class A. Number two, relapse rates were significantly higher in child view class B and C, 14% versus 4% for relapse. Number, number uh, three is a serious adverse event were more common in child view class B and C, 50% versus 12%. Treatment caused less sustained response, more relapse and serious side effects. Reason number four is a scary one, uh, the milled purgatory or milled limbo. So this happens when we treat patients and they achieve SVR and the lower MELD score that leads to delisting from the transplant list. So this may look good at first, but these patients get stuck in MELD purgatory. And uh, I find this scary, the purgatory meaning in the Wikipedia is a place of suffering or torment, why is that? So they neither feel better nor do they achieve transplant, but rather they tend to have poor quality of life continue to suffer from cirrhosis complication and still have risk of HCC. Kari et al. analyzed the use of soft-based 
uh, therapy in patients with decompensated cirrhosis, N of 622 across four clinical trials, and concluded that although approximately uh, one third of the patient uh, of decompensated patient achieved class, uh, shall be class A with DAA therapy, more than half of the patient remained in milk purgatory, 330 remained in the milk purgatory, achieving uh, basically nothing. Um, the reason number five is delayed transplant. Two factors play a role here. We talked first uh, in, the, in the previous slide about the milk purgatory and delisting from transplant list. And then the second reason is that treatment of HCV will preclude these patients from accessing a hepatitis C liver donor pool. Reason number six is a limited treatment options. So guidelines of HCV treatment recommend against the use of interferon and protease inhibitors. Uh, based regimen and treatment of patients with decompensated cirrhosis. Current guidelines accept the use of sofosbuvir based DAA regimen in decompensated cirrhosis. That's true. However, the use of sofosbuvir in patients with renal impairment G5 less than 30 is controversial. I have uh, studies that favored soft based regimen in patients with uh, low GFR like this Noir and Italian 2016 and Nazario Italian 2016. Both had a low number of patients included in the study was an N of 12 and 17 respectively. The target trial by Saxena uh, also in 2016 concluded that SVR was achieved in 83% of patients with renal impairment treated with soft-based regimen. However, these patients have higher rate of anemia, worsening renal dysfunction, and serious adverse event. I want to borrow a verse from Mayo Clinic book and say that the needs of the patient come first. You will find this on their website, written on their walls, but not in their presentation tonight. Again, the need of the patient comes first. The patient, they do not need decreased SVR rate. They do not want to uh, have increased relapse or more side effects. They do not want to be stuck in milk purgatory. They do not want cirrhosis complication, HCC, poor quality of life, delayed transplants, limited options of treatment. We talk a lot about scores, classes, and numbers, but remember, the patient is more than a number. Thank you. Again, really great presentations. Thank, uh, thank you guys, both teams. Uh, we're now gonna move on uh, to the um, to uh, Mayo Clinic uh, Jacksonville for the pro rebuttal. Good night, everyone. So regarding our patient, the team, or uh, the opposing team uh, stated that this patient has decompensated cirrhosis, but actually we don't know that. He only has mild encephalopathy and large esophageal varices, but we don't know he actually has decompensated cirrhosis. He doesn't have ascites. They didn't tell us that he has elevated bilirubin, albumin, or PTINR. Therefore, his child perk uh, score will be probably an eight, uh, an A. Um, therefore, the data that was presented by the team regarding child perk uh, B and C doesn't really describe this patient. So the other concern about this patient not being eligible for hepatitis C positive uh, transplant is not really um, a concern in, at this time. We do transplant patients who have negative hepatitis C um, with hepatitis C positive uh, um, donors. And so that doesn't mean that we cannot treat immediately and then treat him in the event he actually gets a hepatitis C um, transplant. Um, on the other hand, so the last numbers from today actually of the patients that are listed in the kidney uh, waiting list, because as we said, this patient does have an elevated um, he has CKD, so he would might need a kidney uh, transplant. So the waiting list. Um, numbers are 91,795, while the patients waiting for liver transplant are around 12,000. The offers last year for liver transplant was 174 in the whole United States, and all, only 7,000, almost 500 patients uh, were transplanted. That means that there's a lack of 5,000 organs for these patients. And therefore, it makes sense for this patient who actually does have compensated cirrhosis to treat him with hepatitis C um, antiviral. So 
um, the data that was presented on the first slide by the other team was a 2010 paper. Um, we do have more recent data with the uh, AAs showing that um, patients who receive this treatment have decreased mortality, have decreased um, um, decreases um, portal hypertension, decreases varicell bleeding, decreases um, the risk of HCC. Uh, and therefore we believe this patient will really benefit from getting treatment prior transplant. He, as we mentioned, if his MELT score is 17, if we believe his creatinine is 2.5, which first of all is CKD, so it's not really real liver related, overestimating his MELT score, um, then this patient actually, as my uh, co-resident uh, showed, he the treatment for patients in the MELT score around that All right, uh, we ran out of time there. Um, so we're gonna move on uh, to the University of Florida Jacksonville for their uh, con rebuttal. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bhakti Shima. I'm from UF Jacksonville. And our position is patients with decompensated cirrhosis, CPT, B, or C, and CKD stage four and above should not be immediately considered for anti-HCV treatment. There are a few questions for our patients. So as you all know, patient had a recent decompensatory event. He had a esophageal varices seen endoscopy and hepatic encephalopathy. The other team mentioned a uh, patient is not decompensated, although these are the classic decompensatory states and definitions of decompensation of a patient with cirrhosis. So these are classic conditions. Then the next questions we have, is the patient eligible for liver transplant? What is the MELT score? Is it driven by creatinine? There's some hints on that from the other team. What are the side effects of early pre-liver transplant treatment? And how will it affect liver transplant and MELT purgatory? Our other colleagues from Mayo Clinic mentioned this study, which is the HCV target cohort with a recent uh, article with Verna et al. that SVR rates were high in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. However, the improvement in MEL score, bilirubin or albumin after a median follow-up of four years were only minimal. And a state of MEL purgatory may evolve in some of these patients. We all know the anti-HCV regimens can get complicated with decompensated cirrhosis as well as with CKD. We know that protease inhibitors are contraindicated and in CKD B and C, and there's a black box warning by FDA. Soft metabolites, GS33107 is renally excreted. Classically, it was avoided in patients like these. However, recent data with soft valpatasvir has some favor, although the, all the studies mentioned in the guidelines are talking about ESRD patients, not CKD stage four patients. We also know ribavirin and its metabolites are excreted renally and anemia is common in CKD patients. There's also drug-drug interactions. Our colleagues also mentioned studies from Fernandez Carrillo et al. And they, they made comments on my, my co-fellow about a study he mentioned, Spanish study in 2010. It was in fact the study of from Dr. Fernandez Carrillo in 2017. And the incidence of SAEs is high in the Spanish study and decompensation was the most common SAE, safety being poorest in CPT, B and C patients. What is the long-term outlook? So the other team has been kept on mentioning about long-term outlook post anti-HCV therapy. Although we argue that HCV treatment may not improve liver-related death or need for transplantation. And this has been time and time again mentioned by the same studies that they quoted. They quoted the study by Bella et al. in 2016. And the, there are a few other studies and we have study by Dr. Toro as well. And the study they mentioned by, by Dr. Fernandez Carrillo as well. And this, this All right, thank you guys. Uh, again, both teams really making it tough for the judges here. Um, so speaking of the judges, we'll turn to them first uh, for questions for the participants. Uh, Dr. Kotesh, do you have uh, any questions for either of the teams? 
I do. First, uh, great job, guys, um, uh, both on the pro and the con. I have a question for the pro. Um, you, you mentioned cost safety and SVR. Is that what determines destination treatments in those patients? Is the success of SVR what determines survival? Are you going to reverse um, decompensation? Because we cannot argue that this patient is not decompensated with hepatic encephalopathy. And would you not discuss transplant with this patient? So, um, so answering this question. So I think that yes, transplant can't be discussed with him. That's not off the table, but we, what we expose is that we should treat him first. As the other team was saying, this is a timing of treatment. Eventually he might need to go to transplant according to his um, further, if he further decompensates. Um, but we believe that he's at that stage in which we can treat him and see how he does. There's a 20% of patients who actually get treatment and are, are able to be delisted. And there's a 30% who actually is able to not be listed at all. So we think these are significant percentages. Um, and given the organ shortage and the fact that the, the treatment is cost effective, then it would be reasonable to treat him first, see how he does and um, go from there basically, given, given the organ shortage and the fact that other people, other patients might benefit from this organ. Uh, while we can help the patient not to deteriorate further or deteriorate at all by using hepatitis C treatment. I agree with what Danielle is saying as well. Uh, given the information uh, or lack thereof um, that we were with this prompt, we don't know if this patient is even a candidate for transplant. I think Danielle is correct that we should mention uh, and provide this patient with all of their options. But when you think about uh, not only um, alleviating the burden on transplant lists, even the economic uh, benefits of what the MELD score of where our colleagues actually projected this patient to be between 17 and 18, it's cost effective to pre-treat uh, with direct acting antivirals prior to even considering transplant. And even in the MELD score that they had predicted, their adjust, this patient's quality, adjusted quality of life years is higher with pre-liver transplant treatment as opposed to post-liver transplant treatment, uh, which is why we're continuing to make uh, the motion to uh, begin direct actively as opposed to after transplant. Hey, Dr. Clark, do you have any questions for the team? Uh, no, I want to say an uh, excellent job to both sides of the of the of the debate presenters tonight. So, very good job, Dr. Syed. Um, I have a question for the con team, uh, UF Jacksonville, uh, and my question is that uh, uh, let's say. We know that uh, treatment of hepatitis C uh, in patients with CKD um, may lead to reduction in the patient's uh, chances of going towards dialysis in the future. And dialysis can significantly affect quality of life. So what is your answer to the lost opportunity of treating hepatitis C and preventing the need for dialysis in the future and adverse effect of quality with that? So just to understand the question correctly, your question is regarding dialysis affecting treatment? Dialysis affecting quality of life. Yes. I... Okay. Yes. So dialysis definitely affects quality of life in patients, all kinds of patients. So if dialysis is, is a problem, so what, what? how do we tackle dialysis? So we get the kidney guys on board and we see if a patient can be qualified for a dual listing. And in this setting, well, where we can treat patients post-transplant with DAAs, 
that gives us increases the donor pool and patients may have access to dual organs, which is very hard for patients to be having dual organ chances if they don't have access to the HCV pool. So HCV can easily, not easily, but can be treated post transplant and they can have access to dual organs. And I would also like to make a point, additional point, which our colleagues had mentioned earlier about deaths and decompensation rates. So, so we, there is a study from Britain in 2017 with Dr. Chung, more than 800 patients. And that in that study, as you can see here, adverse events follow up period 15 months of patients with decompensated cirrhosis treated in the UK. So you can see they're all, their as um, decompensation HCC transplant rates were decreasing, but post nine to 12 months, these parameters start increasing, suggesting that the treatment is futile pre-liver transplant in these borderline patients. Okay, fantastic. Um, as the judges for a third and final debate go into a private virtual room to determine the winner, please remember that there's still time to enter your comments in the chat box, ask a question or share a compliment. Tell us which medical institution or city you represent and the role you play in the fight against liver disease. As soon as they're finished, the entire judging panel will meet and determine the overall winner. It should take us just a few minutes. While the judges are deliberating, the ALF has a very special invitation to all attendees who may or may not be members of the Medical Advisory Councils called MAX for short. I was involved with the MAX since I was a fellow in Chicago and participated in the uh, liver debates. I'm thankful I didn't have to go up against any of these teams, which are fantastic. And uh, when I relocated to Florida, I suggested we begin hosting the academic debates in the Southeast. I served as a chair for the last year's inaugural Southeast Academic Debates in Florida. I was happy to serve as this year's co-chair and I'm very thankful to Dr. Zori uh, for, for joining me in, in, in organizing this event. It's been very rewarding, a very rewarding experience and I encourage others to get involved. If you're a healthcare provider, physician, advanced practitioner, nurse, PA, pharmacist, transplant coordinator, dietitian, or nutritionist, we invite you to join. MAC members volunteer the time and expertise to help advance the mission of the ALF. For example, they assist with local and national educational programs like the academic debates, ask the experts or various patient and professional programs, as well as media opportunities and advocacy initiatives. We encourage all healthcare professionals to treat patients with liver disease to join, especially those who are early in their careers. There are several medical advisory councils throughout the country. The Southeast MAC includes members from Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and focuses on initiatives from those states. For information on the ALS Medical Advisory Council in the Southeast, or other parts of the country, please contact Kathy Flynn at kflynn at liverfoundation.org. We'll also share Kathy's contact info in the chat box. I wanna also uh, briefly give a special thanks to unsung heroes like Kathy Flynn and Jackie Dominguez. I mean, really without uh, these individuals from the ALF uh, and, and also our, our uh, other uh, uh, members of the ALF who are helping to organize and, 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 and very tech savvy individuals you know, we can't thank them enough without this, uh, without their, their their involvement, none of this could be possible. So I wanna uh, send a special thanks from Dr. Zori and I. I'm gonna hand the program out for Dr. Dr. Zori while I go check on the pan on the judges. And uh, thank you all again for being here. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Mailspin. Uh, yeah, I wanna echo um, his thanks to Kathy, uh, Lindsay and Kat, who um, really were the ones who put this together. Uh, Miguel and I pretty much just followed their lead. Um, but <clears throat> I want to turn again to um, 2020 um, and uh, the pandemic, which I think has uh, affected everyone. Um, but despite the COVID-19 pandemic, the American Liver Foundation was able to serve the liver community in a variety of meaningful ways. For example, in the past year alone, the ALF has created an online website to, sh to share COVID-related information and resources. The National Helpline 1-800-GO-LIVER provided support to more than 6,300 patients and their families so far this year. Its online patient support group grew to over 30,000 followers. The ALF hosted more than 40 national and local educational webinars focusing on liver health uh, topics. 
in the summer, the ALF launched the Living Donor uh, Liver Transplant Information Center, a program to help individuals on the transplant waiting list identify potential living donors and provide reliable and comprehensive information on living donor liver transplantation using multimedia resources. In September, the ALF hosted a NASH roundtable bringing together NASH patients, caregivers, and advocacy organizations, hepatologists, and endocrinologists to understand the needs of NASH patients and to identify solutions to empower them. As a result of the roundtable, the ALF will create a NASH Patient Bill of Rights and Patient Physician Discussion Guide. The ALF Annual Advocacy Day went virtual in 2020. Instead of an in-person visit to Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., the ALF trained more than 100 pe people who participated in 30 vir virtual visits with legislatures. The ALF hosted its first annual virtual conference entitled the Educated Patient, a Liver Conference. The leading medical, leading medical experts, including Tamar Today, Ghassan Abualfa, and Jennifer Guy, Sheila Eswara, and Ali Zarnpar, plan, uh, planned a patient conference to offer education on liver cancer, clinical trials, treatments, and palliative care with an opportunity to interact virtually with uh, other patients. The ALF hosted academic debates in several major areas across the country. The final two debates 2020 will take place next week, the Southern California Academic Debate on December 9th and the Michigan Academic Debates on December 10th. Uh, these were just a few of the ways the ALF benefited the liver health community in 2020. To continue the important work of the American Liver Foundation, I ask that everyone make a donation to support this worthwhile cause. It's easy to do. Just click on the link in the chat box and make a tax deductible gift. Now more than ever, Liver patients need the ALF's resources and support. If you haven't done so already, please take a minute to donate now. And now we're gonna hear again from Kathy Flynn from the American Liver Foundation. Thank you, Dr. Zori. What an impressive evening this has been. Um, so excited and so inspired by um, the young professionals who have um, presented and rebutted some of the um, very controversial and, and thought-provoking topics. Um, before we wrap up the second annual um, Southeast Academic Debates, I'd like to echo what Dr. Malispin um, said earlier and extend an invitation to members of the audience, the debate participants, and any other healthcare professionals who treat patients with liver disease um, to join one of the American Liver Foundation's medical advisory councils. Um, we have them all over the country, as Dr. Malispin said, and we would love to have you um, become involved. Um, and if you'd like to try us on for size, um, I invite you to join us uh, to our next Southeast Medical Advisory Council. It's a virtual meeting on Tuesday, December 8th. Um, it's the last quarterly MAC meeting of 2020, um, and you'll have the opportunity to network with other healthcare professionals on screen. Um, and participate in a professional education program that will feature Dr. Ram Subramanian, who's one of our judges tonight, um, from Emory University in Atlanta. Dr. Subramanian um, is Emory's medical director of liver transplantation and the director of the liver critical care services. Um, as well as a highly respected transplant hepatologist. He's going to speak about advancing extracorporeal liver support. Um, and again, the meeting is on Tuesday, December 8th at seven o'clock. You can see that up on your screen. Um, I hope that you're interested in joining us. So if you're a registered participate, participant tonight, you're going to receive an email from us with this invitation. We just invite you to register and you'll receive a link to, um, to the meeting. I hope that you all stay connected with the American Liver Foundation on social media, like us on Facebook and follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. In fact, while you're watching us now, why don't you subscribe to our ALF YouTube page? By connecting with the American Liver Foundation, you will be alerted to all the exciting events and programs that we offer. And our plans for 2021 are already in the works. So please follow, like, subscribe, do it all, stay informed. Um, and we'd love to have you become part of the ALF family. 
Um, I'd like to read some of the um, some of the comments that have been coming in because I've been looking over my shoulder and watching on another screen. A um, lot of people are, are sending compliments to the debate teams. Um, well done, Dr. Chima. Um, Dr. Galli is thanking his team. Good job, Hamish. Um, Deb Deep says, wow, this is competitive. Erin um, Parkinson loves the questions. She says, great questions. Um, and Daniela's gotten some uh, some comments that are, are complimentary, strong arguments, nicely stated. Um, so you have a lot of fans out there. Um, and I do believe that um, our judges are, you know, behind closed doors right now waiting for, um, we're waiting for notification that they've, they've made a decision. Um, and I'm, so I'm gonna read out a couple more of these wonderful comments. Great job, Dr. Zaver. Um, Gina says, thank you to the ALF team. Great job. Um, Dr. Galley, well done. Uh, Bakht and Kiro. Uh, Ab Abadesh Payer says, great presentations, everyone. Thank you. Um, Deb Deep congratulates everyone straight across the board. Um, uh, Dr. Raj says, excellent organization. And he thanks ALF for sponsoring this event. Thank you so much, Dr. Raj. Um, Again, uh, kudos to Dr. Zori and Dr. Malaspin on selecting such thoughtful debate topics. Everybody's saying that they love the questions, they love the debates, um, and they have absolutely um, gone above and beyond. Um, so I'm going to just check with um, our, oh, I'm getting a message that our, our judges have come to a decision on this. So I think we will start welcoming back um, all of our debate teams our mentors, our judges, and our co-chairs. Um, they're, they're gonna start coming back on our screen any second. Um, and while we um, start seeing them come back up, I'd like to take just the opportunity to um, once again, thank our co-chairs, Dr. Malaspin and Dr. Zori. Um, you know, these Physicians are so very busy taking care of patients um, all day, and yet they have carved time out of their schedule over the last few months to help us prepare for tonight. Um, they've recruited the, the participating teams and mentors and judges, um, and they have worked um, arduously to um, come up with these relevant liver health topics and to assign those topics to the teams. Um, and then they've also had to put up with our, you know, check-in calls every every couple of months or, or as we got closer weeks. Um, so I cannot thank them enough. Um, I'd also like to thank my ALF team who's with us tonight. Um, Kat and Lindsay are the backbone of our technology tonight. Ivory's been working the chat feature um, and Jackie has lent her guidance to us uh, because she was the person who actually uh, came up with the idea of the academic debate so many years ago. Um, so I, I think I've thanked everyone that I, I need to thank on you know, the planning side, um, but I also have to thank all of our debate teams, every mentor and every judge who served tonight. Um, we cannot thank you enough. We do invite you to become involved with the American Liver Foundation. Um, and we are waited, waiting with bated breath to hear who those winners are. So I won't prolong the agony uh, much longer. I will turn it over to our moderators. All right, thank you, Kathy. Sure. Uh, I also wanted to thank the teams again. I think you guys all did a really great job, and uh, especially under these circumstances and with the technology, which make everything a little bit more tricky. Um, the judges have deliberated and chosen winners for uh, each of the three debates, all six teams, and their mentors uh, should be congratulated for the research um, and their preparation that they put in the presentations and rebuttals. This evening, I know the judges faced a very difficult decision with all three debates. Um, the announcement we've all been waiting for is just minutes away, and I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Mailspin to announce uh, the winners for the first debate. All right, here we go. This is the exciting part we've all been waiting for. So uh, just a reminder, each team was judged on the following. Number one, presentation content and organization. Number two, presentation and rebuttal skills. Number three, use of research supporting their position. Number four, responses to questions. And lastly, overall style and digital delivery. So we're ready to announce the winners with our first debate featuring Dr. Gonzalez and Dr. Hassan from Cleveland Clinic, Florida. 
and Dr. Earl and Dr. Sajjani from uh, Emory University. Their topic was a 45 year old male with a history of alcohol related cirrhosis is found to have an acute portal vein thrombus with nuanced ascites. Tips is recommended versus medical management. On behalf of the judges, Dr. Clark, Dr. Kidney, and Dr. Syed, the winner of the first debate is Emory. So congratulations, Dr. Earl and Dr. Sajana, Sajadi, and uh, their mentor, Dr. Uh, uh, Mary Margaret, Margaret Flynn. So round of digital applause. <laughs> um, the second debate featuring Dr. Zhang and Dr. Ismail from uh, UF Gainesville and Dr. Larion and Dr. Morrison from MUSC, their topic was the new uh, liver allocation system has decreased health disparities. On behalf of the judges, Dr. Castro, Dr. Thomas, and Dr. Subramanian, the winner of the, the debate number two is MUSC. So congratulations, uh, Dr. Uh, Larian and Dr. Morrison, and uh, their mentors, Dr. Rocky and Dr. Wilner. So digital applause for all you guys. The third and final debate uh, featuring Dr. Fluxa Cardenas and Dr. Zaver from Mayo Clinic Jacksonville and Dr. Abadir and Dr. Chima from UF uh, Florida Jacksonville. Their topic was a 52 year old male with a history of stage four CKD, not on hemodialysis with cirrhosis presents at the clinic. It's found to have on endoscopy large esophageal varices and mild hepatic encephalopathy. Treatment for hepatitis C should begin immediately. On behalf of the judges, Dr. Clark, Dr. Kotesh, and Dr. Syed, the winner of debate number three is Mayo Clinic Jacksonville. So congratulations to Dr. Uh, Fluxa Cardina and Dr. Uh, Zaver and their, uh, their mentors, Dr. Raj and Dr. Pankpapong. All right, congratulations to every team that participated in the debates this evening. All your presentations were really excellent. On behalf of the American Liver Foundation, my co-chair, Dr. Mailspin, thank you to everyone who joined us for the Southeastern Academic Debates. We're grateful for all six institutions, the participants, uh, our esteemed panel of judges, uh, and for all those who made donations to support the mission of the ALF. And thanks to our generous donors who uh, were recognized during the pre-debate reception. We invite, everybody, we invite everyone to stay involved with the ALF uh, in 2021 and hope you'll join us for the next next year for the